Happy Father's Day. So a dad who had just finished reading a book on parenting was convicted about some of the things that, uh, well, that, that he had been failing to do as a parent. So feeling conviction, he went upstairs to talk to his son. And as he was making his way up the stairs, his son was uh, practicing his drums. Something you never want to buy your son if you're, no. <laughs> so he, he could hear him up there, loud sound. And uh, so he knocked on the door and said, hey, son, you got a minute? He said, sure, Dad, I always have a minute for you. And he said, I just wanted you to know that uh, I love the way you play drums. And his son said, oh, well, th thanks, Dad. That, that, that's great. And so he started back downstairs about halfway. He realized that he had not really conveyed the message he intended to. So he went back and knocked again and said, hey, hey do you have another minute? Dad, I told you, I always have, have a minute for you. So he went over and sat on the bed and says, when I was here before, I had something I wanted to tell you, and I, I didn't really get it said. And what I really meant was, your mom and I think you're really great. He goes, oh, so you and mom think I'm really great. Yeah, we, we think you're, you're amazing. He said, well, well, Dad, thanks a lot. So he... Once again left, he's halfway down the stairs and realized, still haven't said what I want to say. So back up the stairs and knocking on the door, hey, do you have a minute? Dad, I always ha ha have a minute for you. He says, well, I, I came twice and I really haven't said what I want to say. What I really came to tell you is I love you. He sat down on the bed and he said, Son, son I, I love you with all my heart. Not, not, not your mom and me, but me. And he hardly had ever told his son that. And the son said, Dad, that's great. I love you too. Gave him a big hug, and he started out of the room and back down the stairs when the son stuck his head out of the room and said, Dad, you got a minute? He said, sure. Have you just come back from a seminar or something? What, what's, what's going on? <laughs> Because that's the way it is most of the time with dads. <laughs> They're not as lovey-dovey as they should be. So today, as Neil mentioned, we're in, in Luke chapter 15. It's Father's Day. A dad who had two sons. One was self-righteous, a rule keeper. <laughs> so if you're not keeping rules... <laughs> I might, we can close right here, I think, right now. Wow. The other was rebellious, reckless, kind of a party guy. And if you want to put a title on the message, I would say, A Heart of a Father. Most of you know this story, a younger son leaves leaves the father, the family behind, the older brother didn't really have a good understanding of what a relationship with the father was all about. And the focus really is the, the great heart of love of the father. And, and first, I, I believe if, if, we, if we put it in context, if we put it in time frame, so to speak, this is a good Jewish father. He's trained his sons as most Jewish fathers would. He wanted them to know the Lord and walk with their God, and he probably had trained them in Hebrew scriptures. Dad, this, this Jewish father read and taught his children God's word, and he taught them how to pray. That's what the Jewish fathers would do, how to come to God and spend time with him. He, he I'm sure, as a good Jewish dad, tried to live a godly example and he was active in their practical lives. The Jewish proverb, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Not a promise, but certainly a, a proverb about the right thing to do. And like most fathers, he would have hoped and desired his sons would learn from him, 
good things, godly things, moral things. But, but right at the beginning of this story, there in Luke chapter 15, if you want to go to verse 11, that's where the story of the lost sons is. It says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So, Lord, we just open your word. And we would so much desire that you would help us open our hearts and hear your voice. And that good things would be planted in our heart and it would bear much fruit for your kingdom. And, Lord, for your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When the younger son asked for his share of the father's estate, and please listen, please tune in, it was a legal thing for him to do, according to Old Testament law, but it was also a hurtful and rebellious thing for him to do. See, the Old Testament law stated that the younger son would be entitled to one-third of his father's estate. And it was acceptable for a man to divide his estate among his heirs while he was still alive. But this would usually happen when a son was preparing for marriage or having a family or starting a business. But here the son was basically saying, I want my freedom. Dad, your lifestyle, your training, it's not for me. I'm tired of living under your control. I want to do my own thing. It's almost like he's saying to his dad, and it's very disrespectful. Dad, it's almost like I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance, and I don't have a reason for it other than I want out of here. On his smartphone, he was listening to Born to be Wild. That's echoing in his mind. His attitude was selfish and rebellious. He has decided he knows more about life and how to live life than his father. I think a lot of young people think that. You probably thought that when you were growing up. Oh, man, I, this, these guys, my parents, they don't know anything. The father here in this parable shows amazing patience, love, and grace. By allowing his son to, to choose his own path. And he gives his son the required portion of his own life's work. He had worked all his life for this. And now he takes a third of it. It's kind of like the son wanted what his father could give him materially. But not his wisdom. Not his relationship. Not his counsel. It's like people who want the Lord in their lives. Oh, I'm a Christian but live in a way that doesn't reflect his word, his wisdom, or his desire for their lives. Lord, I want all your blessings. I want your guidance and direction, but I don't want to live the way you want me to live. It's kind of like there in verse 12 where it just says, Father, give me. Uh, that's a very profound statement. That's all he wanted was him to give him something. A Christian can say, Father, give me. But I don't want you to rule over my life. I don't want you to instruct me. It's a picture of a rebellious child. Just give me what I want. Look at verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, all his stuff, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The far country. I think that phrase could be any place we go or, or thing we do to get away from God's control or oversight of our lives. Today, the, the son might put it like this if he sort of psychoanalyzed what the father was doing in his life. He would say something like, you know, my, my dad is just so oppressive. I need to get away. He's too controlling. He, he's overprotective. 
I was forced to go to synagogue when I was a kid. I couldn't be me. None of his rules made sense. My friends don't live like this. This is not who I am. He doesn't know me. He doesn't understand me. People often want to blame others for choices they make to avoid personal responsibility and accountability. Oh, it's my parents' fault. It's my siblings' fault. It's the school's fault. Whatever it might be. What does the parable say there in verse 13? It says, he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The the word prodigal, interesting word. It it can mean riotous. It can mean wasteful. It can mean reckless. Despite the father's good example and care and love, the son made a choice. How he would live his life. It was a bad choice, but it was his choice. And it's same today. We all make choices. God gives us a free will. That's part of the picture here. Okay, th- this is your choice. Uh, you, you go and do what it is you want to do. And God never forces you to follow him, to obey his word. It's a choice you make because God gave you a free will. So this young said, son said, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to party. I'm going to enjoy today. I'm going to make my own rules. I'm going to live for now. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to live my own life. Now, now it's true, sometimes grown children can be viewed by parents as still children. And parents do need to let their kids grow and make choices recognize when they're grown and they are adults. And siblings can treat other younger siblings that way. Like maybe he felt the father and the older son was treating him like a child. But, but here, here in our text, here, here in the scripture, the father respects his son, his free will, his choices. So he gives him his inheritance. It may have broke his heart. But he let his son be his own man. Okay, that's what you want, son. I'm going to respect it. In verse 14, but when he had spent all, when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his pigs, swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. But no one gave him anything. He couldn't even get pig food. But when he came to himself, it says, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And here I perish with hunger. After he had spent everything and had the riotous living and did everything he wanted to do, And he reached the bottom, and sometimes we need to reach the bottom before we look up. Looking for wrong things in wrong places, when most of the time the Lord has already given us all we need, if we'll just wait, if we'll just trust, and we'll just obey. And sometimes that's hard to do. That's kind of the picture here. Wasn't willing to wait. Wasn't willing to trust. In this place, in this time, he's in the far country. Nobody cares about him. They don't care what he needs. They don't care who he is. And sometimes the world can seem really barren, really lonely, really cold, uncaring. Thunder and lightning could be going on. It seemed like this guy had hit bottom and everyone looked the other way. He's got no money. His party buddies are gone. His wild, extravagant lifestyle, he's abandoned. There's no government handouts. There's no benefits. Not even a bowl of pig food to keep you from starving. No food stamps. Not even any unemployment. There he is, starving to death in a pig pen. He had just lived for now. No thought about consequences of the future. 
He, he had to look at the reality and his present circumstances, and he had to face the truth. You ever had to do that? Just stop and go, okay, let's face the truth here. And he came to himself, verse 17. How many of my father's hired servants? In other words, man, my father treats his servants better than I'm being treated. He, he, he recognized some things about his dad. Uh, how kind he was and how, 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 how he had integrity. He said, even my father's hired servants have bread enough and spare, and, and I'm perishing with hunger. He had just lived for now. And then it goes on. I will arise, verse 18. Go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him, ran to him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, to use a Bible word, basically the son Repented. <laughs> Repentance is not just being sorry for what you've done or crying or feeling bad. No, no, repentance is you get up and you do something. That's what he did. The biblical definition of repentance is you've been going in one direction that you realize is wrong. And you turn around and say, I'm going to go the right way. You determine and take action to move or go in the right direction. And here we see another great truth about the father. He was eager, he was willing, and he was desirous to forgive. That's who the father is. When someone is truly seeking forgiveness and willing to change, not only is the father Gracious, but we are to be gracious and forgiving when somebody's willing to change and seek forgiveness. But the father did not withhold his grace. The son knew he needed to repent, and the father wanted reconciliation, and he was willing to give it. While he was still far off, the father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. No longer to be worthy to call your son. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found. And they began to make merry. When, when the son came home, turned toward the father. The father was waiting. He was watching. And in love, the father ran to meet his son, his child. But part of the story is when, when we have wronged someone, we need to ask forgiveness. To do what's right. To take responsibility for our own choices, not to justify them. Also, we who have been forgiven much, it's right and godly for us to forgive others. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, you have this verse, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God or the Father in Christ forgave you. Is there anybody you need to forgive? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, Bear with one another. Forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. This is the, this is the heart of forgiveness here of the Father. Not, not everyone is gracious and willing to forgive. The Father ran to his son, hugged and kissed before the son ever said a word. He's not trying to protect himself for more hurt. Oh, here he comes. Let's see what he has to say. 
Not, not, not trying to, 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 to make him suffer because of what he's done. He ran toward him. Forgiveness. And he put a robe on him. In other words, the old, dirty clothes, he gave him something new. You know, if anyone be in Christ, he's a, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. There, there's great imagery here in this, in this coming home to the Father. First, the new robe. Let's put a ring on his finger. It's, it's the family seal. You're back in the family. You're part of the family. You're, you're robed in something brand new. You're part of the family. And let's put shoes on your feet. Only slaves went barefoot. I'm not going to make you like one of my hired servants. Things are new. You're back in the family. And you're going to be treated just like you always were treated. And there's great rejoicing. Amazing celebration. They, they killed the fatted calf. This was a, 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 a calf, a cow that they would keep in a special bin and feed it the best grain and, and make sure it was always healthy. And, and it was saved for a celebration of great importance, like a wedding or a great accomplishment that someone might have done. And here this guy comes back having spent his inheritance. He's filthy. He, he's hungry, has no shoes. And we're having a great celebration for him. Yeah, that's the picture of the father. When someone repents and comes home. And he, he says, bring the fatted calf here, kill it, let's be merry. For this my son, verse 24, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they begin to make merry. And may I just say this, that this is true of everyone who comes home to the father through repentance and receives forgiveness in Christ. There's a party in heaven. Now, the other brother's not too happy. In verse 25 now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So, so he called one of the servants and asked, well, what, what's going on? What does this mean? Oh, your brother has come, verse 27. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. What? I was going to use that fatted calf for me. He was angry. Wouldn't go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. Son. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, doesn't even call him his brother. As soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him? He said, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead. He's alive again was lost and is found. It seems the oldest is a little uptight, wouldn't you think? He's a little grudgingly obedient to his dad. He, he seems bitter. Father maybe treats the younger different or, or better than me. There's this obvious sort of sibling issue going on there. And, and sometimes this, this can happen in a, in a family. The father's got two sons. And this guy has this, this, this sense that he's not being treated the same. And he's got an attitude. And, and I think sometimes you can see that in siblings. And this rivalry can go on. Uh, it's unfair. I'm ignored. I'm forgotten. I'm disregarded. I'm overlooked. I'm wounded. I'm not going to play. I'm taking my marbles and go home. That, that's his attitude. You know, I grew up in a family of five kids. I had an older brother, older sister, younger sister, younger brother. I was the most middle child you could possibly be. Therefore, the most well-balanced. <laughs> but also the most ignored. I'm not playing any. No. The, the, I remember one time, some of you are old enough to remember photo albums. <laughs> now it's just phones, right? But I remember going through the photo album one time. My mom was there. I go, 
Mom, there's not that many pictures of me. Well, the camera broke for a while. <laughs> no, if you're the middle child, they just don't take a bunch. I'm sorry, but welcome to the club. It's the firstborn and the baby, right? All these years I've served your mom. He's got this attitude. This actually kind of an overinflated view of himself. I served you all these years. It's nothing about the father's investment in him. Nothing about all the training the father had given him and all the love he had given him. I never disobeyed. No, let me stop there. What kid has never disobeyed? This is what he says. I've never disobeyed. Sure, right. Blame and contempt for others. Sort of blame of his dad. It, it, it's somehow all the dad's fault now that the, that the son left. Now, now, please tune in. Each child is different. And as a parent, you do treat them different. I, I had three kids, and they were all extremely different. Some of them needed Mr. Spoon. Come on back, we're going to meet Mr. Spoon again. And some of them, you could just look at them, and they would start crying. Oh, Dad. They're all different. Maybe he treats the youngest different. I'm sure he did. But does it mean you love one more than another or value one more than another? It's like comparing apples to oranges. The father loved them both equally. He's kind and gracious to both of them, although he relates to them differently. So, so what's the story about? Well, let, let me take you back to the beginning of the whole chapter because this is what precedes this story. Chapter 15 of Luke, verse 1. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near him to hear him speaking of Jesus. Pharisees, scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. So he spoke a parable. What, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Doesn't mean he doesn't love the 99. And when he is found, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. He comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, Search carefully until she finds it. Or it could be a BOGO coupon. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Father cares about the lost. That's the purpose of the parable. He wants the lost found. Without him, they're alone. They'll lose their way. They'll be like a lost sheep. They'll go the wrong way. They'll spin it all on riotous living. They'll perish. But when they're found, there's joy in heaven. There's joy in the Father's house. In fact, all heaven rejoices. This, this man has two sons. Both sinners. The younger is reckless and rebellious, disrespectful, crazy in his spending behavior, doesn't seem to have boundaries in his life. He, he's very reckless. And the older is jealous, has a lack of love and respect for his father and brother, and he's somewhat phony and selfish and self-righteous. His motives for serving, the father seem egotistical, he's ungrateful, Blind to his own sinfulness, yet the father was loving and gracious and offered his grace and mercy to both. Two sons with a great contrast. When the openly rebellious person comes to his senses, when he turns to the father, he knows he doesn't deserve God's love. 
He knows he doesn't deserve it. While the one who pretends to be devoted to the Father believe they've earned it. They deserve it. It's their rightful inheritance. And believe they are good enough to deserve God's grace and goodness because they've kind of earned it. And, and please listen. We're almost finished. None of us deserve God's grace. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says it this way. As is written, there's none righteous, no, not a single one. And Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The elder son and the younger son. But here's the thing. thing. The father loves me and offers his mercy and his grace to the rebellious to the disobedient, to the prodigal, here's the message. To, to those who, who, who have turned their back on God and want nothing to do with God, I don't want you ruling over me, here's the Father's message. Come home. Come home. I, I, I'm waiting to give you a new life. I'm waiting to, to make you part of the family. I, I'm waiting to reinstate you in my grace and my love. It's those who think they are good enough, the rule keepers, the religious people. He would say this, come into the family, enjoy the feast, the Father loves you. To, to the religious, to the rebellious, God the Father has done all there is to do and can do to give forgiveness of sin, a hope for the future, a wonderful promise of grace and mercy. And my prayer would be that we all experience the power and mercy and grace of God's great love. Here's the thing, if you could sum it all up. We have a heavenly Father who is gracious, loving, and caring, and who's very, very quick to forgive. No matter if you think you're good, or if you pretty much understand how reckless and rebellious you are, the Father says over and over again, whosoever will may come. And he comes to you when you make that first step. That's what I love about this story. Not only is the prodigal son making his way back, the father doesn't wait for him to show up, he runs to him. And the same with the older son. He doesn't say, well, if he's going to stay outside, let him stay out there. No, he steps out and says, son, come in. Come into the family. Come into the feast. And I would say to you on this Father's Day, if you've rebelled, if you've walked away, if you're not living the way the Father wants you to live, then he says, come home. If you're religious and grew up in a church and you, you just come to church, but you don't really know the Lord or follow the Lord or serve the Lord, he would say to you, come on in. Enjoy the feast. Be a part of my family.